So um, I want to thank you for joining us for this third session of our Building the Fugitive Academy conference. My name is Robert Mejia. I'm an associate professor with the Department of Communication at North Dakota State University. Um, for the workshop today, we're focusing on radicalizing power, patronage, and mentorship, featuring Lisa Corrigan and Michael Lechuga. Before we begin our seminar, however, I want to start by recognizing the histories of settler colonialism that mark the lands on which we all live and work. The organizing committee and our panelists are committed to supporting indigenous rights and are grateful for all that these lands have provided. The organizing committee has made a donation to the Warrior Women Project as a meaningful contribution to supporting indigenous peoples across the world. For more information about this organization, um, I'm posting a link right here. You can also find this link um, on our homepage of our conference website where you'll find a link to the Warrior Women Project within our land acknowledgement statement. We ask you to consider um, don donating to this organization or another organization of your choice or um, engaging in acts that continue to support indigenous communities. Also to like to thank our uh, conference co-sponsors. They include Boston College's African and African Dis Diaspora Studies Program, Boston College's Communication Department, the Institute for Liberal Arts, Conference on College Composition and Communication, European Journal of Cultural Studies, Goldsmiths Universities of London's Department of Media Communications and Cultural Studies, the International Communication Association, NCA, or the National Communication Association, North Dakota State University's Department of Communication, Rhetoric Society of America, the University of Texas at Austin, and the University of Pennsylvania Annenberg School for Communication. We appreciate your support. So to begin, or one last thing before we begin, I also want to remind uh, our participants that we do have a Discord uh, channel that's very vibrant, lively. You'll see conversation from the last uh, seminar that ended about 30, uh, 40 minutes ago. I'm posting that link here. Likewise, um, if you have any questions for the panelists, you are always welcome and encouraged to submit them either through the Q&A function or through Discord, which we'll be monitoring. Um, I, I'm really excited for this panel or this workshop, which we're going to be focusing on uh, skill building around two items, which are strategies of mentorship beyond patronage and reimagining organizational structural power. We have two incredible panelists that are near and dear to me and Michael Lechuga and Lisa Corrigan. I wanna just say a few brief words about them before we begin, cause I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing them for the past few years. So I'm actually gonna start with uh, Dr. Lisa Corrigan. So Dr. Lisa Corrigan is a professor of communication and director of gender studies at the University of Arkansas. She is also the director of the gender studies program, uh, as mentioned. Um, affiliate faculty in both African and African studies, American studies and Latin American studies, um, has written multiple books. And the thing I want to say about uh, Lisa is you're, you're in for a treat in terms of the way that she organizes, the way she presents her ideas, um, the experience that she has as a community organizer. I saw this on display firsthand about two years ago when I organized a pre-conference for the National Communication on uh, uh, Communication and the Politics of Survival. Um, the terminology that she gave me in terms of thinking about how I operate as a mentor has been particularly meaningful in thinking about at what in what places can I provide cover for others so that they can do the work that they need to do? And at what places and positions do I need cover from others in order to do the work I wish to do? And so Lisa has been incredibly influential for me and I imagine she's gonna be incredibly influential and insp inspiring to you as well. I could definitely say the same thing about uh, Michael Lechuga. Michael Lechuga is an assistant professor of communication at the University of New Mexico, where he researches and teaches in Latina OX studies, communication studies, rhetoric, migration, settler colonialism studies, and affect studies. For Michael, I first met him uh, when he was the uh, chair for the NCA task force on mentorship and then also as a participant for the pre-conference on communication and the politics of survival, and then as a contributor for the recent communication and critical cultural studies um, forum on communication and the politics of sur survival. Uh, Michael has also been incredibly uh, inspiring and the thing that I appreciate, and I think that uh, attendees will walk away um, well with Michael, and, and the same could be said for Lisa, is that survival is not a metaphor, is grounded in concrete experiences, lived experiences, and that the relationship between the communities you work with isn't as a scholar and an artifact or a scholar and uh, uh, an outside community, but is as co 
co-collaborators, co-participants, um, and emergent knowledge is incredibly important for Michael's work. So I know we're all in for a treat. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I'm going to stop talking now and turn it over to them, and I'll do my best to support them. So thank you all so much. Thanks for that gorgeous introduction, Robert. It's nice to see you, Michael. <laughs> it's nice to see you too. Um, it looks like on the outline, I'm going first. So uh, I think I'll just jump right in. Um, to that introduction, Robert, I got to say, it's, it's been nice to um, build friendship and build collaboration through our various academic networks. And I think speaking to the, the spirit of, of building something instead of, you know, trying to um, tear things down or, or move around in, in ways that are, um, you know, conspicuous or uh, sometimes uh, a little bit precarious for folks. Um, I really wanted to lean into this idea of, of building um, an academy that, that is, I think, accessible and, and really um, creates a space for folks like us, right? Um, before I jump in, though, I, I want to talk about two experiences that I had. Um, as, I, as I was um, getting my PhD, I had the opportunity to design a class with um, a group of facility staff at the University, uh, sorry, at the University of Denver. And this group of facility staff didn't have access to the resources that they had been provided. Um, they were given course release, uh, sorry, course credits basically to take courses at the University of Denver, but without the, the proper infrastructure to provide English language um, instruction for many of these folks, they couldn't take any classes. So um, that was a sort of benefit that was deducted from their pay, but then ultimately never given to them as, as a right. Their children could attend school again if they passed this, this English requirement. And so what we did with our um, sort of institutional privilege at the University of Denver was we collaborated with their English Language Center to have weekend English classes and basic conversational and, and um, uh, basic uh, TOEFL, uh, ESL um, level English, which allowed many of these folks to actually transfer into the university. Um, and then ultimately we started a relationship where many of them organized to um, contact the National Labor Board and get better working conditions for themselves and their colleagues, right? This, this came from using a resource in an institutional capacity that I had and, and that was already built into the system and, and simply leverage that to, to, to benefit these folks. Um, the other instance I, I, was, I was just thinking about before we sort of signed on was, um, I was I was in a conversation with some family recently about uh, my, my time at, at the University of Texas El Paso. So before uh, my first tenure track job, I had a visiting assistant position uh, in leadership studies. And part of my role as a leadership studies um, professor was to travel to El Paso's largest military base, Fort Bliss, and to teach classes at the Sergeant Majors Academy. So the Sergeant Majors Academy at Fort Bliss is the um, place where folks who are training to become Sergeant Majors in the um, United States Army go to learn leadership. And so having this opportunity to teach those folks also gave me a, a different sense of what leadership and mentoring looks like. Um, and the only reason I say this is because I think it's hard to say that there's a one size fits all model for the, the kind of folks that we're trying to lead and trying to uh, collaborate in leadership relationships with. I also had, uh, as, as Robert pointed out, the opportunity to serve as NCA's um, chair of the task force uh, for mentorship that uh, Dr. Kent Ono, who uh, presented earlier uh, this afternoon, put together. And if there's two things that I learned in this role and, and in maybe brought to this role in, in some of the other capacities that I've had is that um, Number one, mentoring is ultimately about access. You, you can't talk about mentorship without talking about um, how um, the academy and, and really all industries um, privilege access for some and disprivilege access, uh, access for others. So in the academy, this means like information, resources, uh, and, and relationships that are built privileging some and then disprivileging others. And um, I think in most industries, we can see that uh, um, this, this sort of like uh, privilege is, is, is like currency. It's passed around and it's given to some, it's, it's gifted to many simply for just being there and it's taken away from some uh, for many disciplinary reasons. And I think that if we can address mentorship from an access perspective, then we can um, kind of see how um, gatekeeping and keeping folks away from these resources and, and information really is just in line with the same sort of academy that we're trying to to rebuild many of the same practices that go into, um, I think, limiting access to folks. And I think folks, particularly from precarious positions, from 
LGBTQ scholars, from uh, scholars of color, BIPOC scholars especially, um, we, we see that access is, is typically associated with one's identity. And, and very um, often that identity um, is already marked in the academy. So we, we can't rely on these sort of like traditional models uh, anymore. The second thing that I'll learn uh, that I learned, and then I'll pass it over to Lisa, is that um, no longer can we rely on the single model of, of mentorship. This idea that one mentor can guide somebody else, like uh, a, a Jedi Knight or something, into a, a, a successful future is, is really um, kind of a myth. And and what this ends up um, creating is a, a patchwork of mentors where folks will seek out a number of incomplete mentoring relationships that they have to sort of navigate and negotiate, which can be contradictory at times, which can often um, move people into, into directions uh, with conflicting sort of like relationships. And of course, there's the pressure and burden of, of being loyal to the, the mentors. I think what we need to, to, to sort of switch to is a constellation model where we know that there's a network of people. We know that there's a group of people who can do different things. And a mentorship plan should focus on creating that network and sustaining that network through you know, various technologies or through various communication channels, uh, giving the mentee an opportunity to, to actually do the learning, giving mentors an opportunity to, to really only mentor in, in things that they're experts on and, and putting the burden of, of organizing all this onto the institution. So uh, those are my two thoughts on, on that and I'll pass it over to Lisa. <laughs> I had no idea that you went to Fort Bliss. So I, want, I definitely want to hear more of those stories because I bet they're really fascinating. fascinating. But I like, that you, I like that you started there because, you know, you and I sort of have that in common that we have these other mentory relationships outside of the academy. And for me, sometimes it creates a lot of contrast. So for the folks who don't know me, I, I, you know, I'm a first generation college student who came up through the debate track. And so and I've been involved in politics for 26 years. And so, and that's campaign work. And in Arkansas, I'm a political strategist. And so for me, you know, I have an academic life. And then I sort of joke that I'm moonlight as a professor because so much of my time is mentoring and like all of these communities of practice with people who do not have PhDs and who aren't in the academy reading the books that we're reading and who aren't in the classroom. And so I met, you know, my mentorship relationships, you know, the ones that I'm producing as a mentor and the ones where I'm receiving mentorship span the state legislature, the state democratic party, all of its caucuses, and the 501c3s that do abolition work, the association of social workers, which is they have taken me up as like an interesting intersection of race, sex, gender, and transforming social work thinking across the state. It's been very interesting. The community clinics, especially around healthcare and access. Um, trans coalition here started in Fayetteville. Uh, the Coalition for Reproductive Justice, because I do a bunch of abortion work, the county courts, which I knew nothing about the quorum courts until a couple of months ago when we got all this CARES money that the Republicans refused to spend on, you know, ha housing subsidies and health care. Um, and, uh, and I run huge advocacy groups in the state with like thousands and thousands and thousands of mentors with a couple of colleagues in public education and gun violence prevention. And so you know, those are all wildly different coalitions of practice than higher ed. And I think that for me, it's really worth thinking outside of higher ed and, and thinking through models of mentorship and of uh, collaboration that aren't just what we see, you know, modeled for us inside of higher ed. So as I was sort of thinking through the multiplicity of my, you know, mentorship um, relationships, especially as an adult. I've been thinking a lot about relationship building as a cornerstone of mentorship. We don't talk a lot about what it means to create healthy and non-toxic relationships, you know, collaborative relationships inside of higher ed. I, I was thinking about mentorship as sharing skills and to be, being able to put those skills into praxis as the outside of just research and teaching. I've been thinking a lot about mentorship as healing from social and institutional trauma and from gatekeeping and gaslighting. And I've been thinking about mentoring and the way that it often reproduces domination through patronage, as we are going to talk about, I think, at length, um, through leaky pipelines, through, I think, really bankrupt communication practices that just sort of get replicated without thought. I sort of think about it as Agent Smith in the Matrix, right? So it just sort of replicates across all of the screens all the time without 
I think, um, really intentional thought about the kinds of relationships that need to be built. I think about mentoring as a framework for learning boundaries and also emotional regulation and the way that we navigate our expectations about risk and failure and success. And I think about mentorship opportunities as a way to build healthy collaborations. I think that mentorship can only really be coalitional. It's the only way out of patronage. It's imperfect, it's often temporary. Sometimes it's durable, but I don't know. I think for me, because so many of my mentorship relations in the academy are either have either been totally toxic, top-down domination relationships on top of me, or they've been alternative peer-to-peer -peer mentoring relationships. It seems to me that scaffolding positive relationships is the way that you build durable coalitions. And, you know, for me, you know, I'm interested in divestment and investment. So I want to divest the money and the resources into the places where the transformative work is happening. So I'm thrilled to be part of this panel and this conference because I think it's focused on that task. You know, and I want to move away from, you know, personality politics and in, into that resource question. Like, what is the best way to divest, you know, money from white supremacist institutions and into progressive politics so we can build, you know, different genealogies of practice? So those are some of the things that I have been thinking about, you know, in terms of the larger question about mentorship and transformational politics. What do you think are qualities of a good mentorship relationship? What's a good mentor to you? Lisa, when, when I, I don't mean to uh, jump in, but when I hear this question, um, in terms of what are qualities of a good mentor, I was wondering if you can speak a little bit more to the emotional regulation uh, conversation. It's just a completely, you know, this notion of healing regulation. Um, it's, it's such a different perspective on mentorship than I've heard others talk about. Yeah, I think on the tenure track, people are really fighty. Okay, so the move is to fight really quickly and draw out the knives and get some blood and you know, put some blood up on the scoreboard. And the tenure track is brutal and it's exhausting and it's exploitative and it's, it feels very precarious and people feel fragile. And that's understandable because you know, it's set up to produce that kind of pressure cooker situation. And so I think that the tenure track and sometimes grad school, not always, not everybody has the same you know, under, you know, like experience in grad school about how the pressure goes there. But I just think the fightiness between like grad school and tenure is really amplified by perceptions of resource scarcity, by toxic mentorship and a total lack of awareness of schemas about how power is built in, in higher ed, whether it's the power of your department or the power of your college or the power of your university or the power of your field or your subfield or your discipline or the journals or whatever. And so people dysregulate and, you know, I'm a debate kid. So all of us have tons of trauma and the women more than the men and the people of color more than the white women. And it's a, it's a brutal kind of thing. So when I came into higher ed, I just sort of retreated probably for 10 years. Cause I'm like, Oh, these are, the, these people are also dysregulated. Like all it's good. If we spend time together, it's just going to augment that dysregulation and produce more angst and strife and conflict and churn. And I really recoil from that as like an organizational affect. So I think when you, when you choose mentors or when you think about your own mentorship, the goal is to produce re emotionally regulated selves that are not producing that churn and not, you know, creating the chaos insofar as you can separate the self from the institution that's producing the white supremacy and sexism and transphobia and classism and fat phobia and the rest of it. So I think that, you know, that's one reason why safe spaces became a way of progressives, especially a decade ago. They didn't have the trauma language necessarily, but they had the goal of trying to create safety for particular people. And I, safety is not a terrible goal, but I'm interested in thinking through you know, how the structures produce the dysregulation and then how they reinforce themselves through suspicion and paranoia and workplace mobbing and gossip and whatever, you know, just the petty human stuff that moves organizations. Michael, did you want to speak somewhat to some of the regulations? Yeah, 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it makes me think of a, of a colleague of mine um, at the University of New Mexico. We recently uh, voted to form a union, and part of the union's labor went immediately into effect, protecting faculty from many of the restrictions that were going to be levied onto uh, faculty. Some even like potential layoffs. But in organizing, um, I I spoke with uh, Elutario, who's the partner of one of my colleagues, um, and he sort of mentioned like uh, he comes from an activist background, uh, a person who um, was part of like uh, Puerto Rican activism for, uh, for decades. And he said something like, it's funny because you have revolutionaries everywhere, but as soon as like the demand for educators comes about, everybody runs away. And I think that like at the end of the day, right, we're, we have uh, an element in our field. And I think there's an element in the humanities in general of, of, of critique. There's a, it's a critical, field we we do criticism really well like whether it's like film criticism literary criticism just the criticism is part of yeah what we do but that shouldn't be what what the the end of our goal is right we we have two teams we can have a demolition team but we also need the the, the construction team um, and this is why i really want to build uh, or like lean into that idea of building right because you you can have the folks who, who want to revolutionize everything, but then what, what about the folks who, who are there afterwards to, to do the rebuilding? And I think this is what Elutario's, Elutario's point was, is that you can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, so to answer the question about what a good mentor is, is it somebody I think who recognizes that part of this, this work is, is like being patient and sitting around and waiting for, for the, the pieces to fall. Um, a lot of that has happened in our field in the last couple of years, we, we saw the, the um, you know, the, the, the summer of uh, 19, I guess, was when, or maybe a summer of 18, when, when things kind of went sour for many folks. The disruption happened, the critiques came. And I think that this, this entire like, project is, is trying to rebuild out of that. Now, the rebuilding is, is a time uh, sensitive process, but it also requires us to like invest in, I think, building materials and in, in building resources and in sharing those resources. So I don't know. I, I don't think people who, who are only minded in, in this sort of like uh, tearing down model are, are, are going to be mentors that can provide both aspects. I think it, it really is this sort of like um, dual headed uh, skill that, that good mentors have of, of being able to stick around and do the rebuilding after the sort of like uh, deconstruction. I think, I think for me, that's an intimacy question, which is hard to do professionally, right? Because the achievement culture is really anti-intimacy and it's hyper competitive. I mean, I say this is a debate kid, but I think that the intimacy is where the durable coalitions actually work. And so I think that I've been thinking a lot about generations because when I came up through grad school, I mean, it was almost, it was white people only, right, who were the opportunities for mentorship. And they were like, don't study race. And, you know, you could study race as long as it was historical, as long as the figures were dead, and you didn't have anything to political to say about it, you were just sort of describing stuff that happened in the past. And I think now, like that, that my, my generation came through, and I just remember this moment, there was a big conference at Northwestern on dissent, and maybe 04. And almost all of the people who are doing the reconstruction work now were at that conference and were doing, you know, work on race and dissent. And I think now about y'all's generation and about the work that you're doing. And it just seems to me that there is a genealogy to be had here. I really like the use of the destruction construction metaphors because I just think that that's how you scaffold the thing, right? Is that you learn from, you know, the things that have been destroyed and rebuild better. So I, I really, I really like that. But, um, but to get back to the question about good mentors. So I obviously think emotional regulation is good in a mentor. But what else do you think, Michael, is good in a mentor? We, we sort of talked about this when we were planning um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and I think, you know, compassion and kindness are things that, that go a long way. Um, and I don't want this to be confused with like, being a pushover or, or being somebody who um, gives folks a free pass to, to act dumb when it, when it comes to just saying things and doing things that are, that are obviously sexist and racist and uh, heteronormative and ableist. I think these things are, are they go without saying. Um, but, but when it comes to compassion as uh, a mentor, one of the things that I think is important for us to remember is that we, we have to admit that we can't do everything. We have to admit that we, as mentors, are, are only 
able to, to speak to our experiences and, and trying to understand where somebody is at in their life is not trying to like replicate the kind of things we went through, right? This is the whole like, I didn't have to pay back my student loan or I had to pay back my student loan so they should do kind of mentality. And that, that's just absurd. Um, I, I do think that um, trying to just be as generous as we can to the folks who have asked us to be their mentors is, is, is really our, our responsibility in, in an institution, especially for folks in precarious positions, um, queer, BIPOC, um, people of um, you know, various precarious backgrounds, especially with multiple of precarious backgrounds. What is, what is gained by like forcing those folks into, into further trauma? And I think that that's just really it. I think too, I mean, especially as a white person, you know, my, I think my goal is to just produce massive opportunities. So in so far as I can hack out space and cash, right, I'm interested in producing opportunities that did not exist previously. I think it's one of the reasons like I like these niche conferences, right, that are doing like the work outside of hustling for, you know, the patronage white viewers, right? I think that this is where the intimate connections are created to help do that kind of work to build new opportunities and to augment, you know, what I think could, are really productive relationships that absolutely do not necessarily take the form of what the conference hustle looks like, you know, the sort of over your shoulder glance at NCA or whatever. Can, can you maybe think of an example of, of something that you've done recently, either in or outside of the academy that, that kind of speaks to that? Um, more specifically? Yeah, so, um, you know, I it, it's interesting. One of the things that I did not know was so toxic was the award stuff. And a couple, I don't know, probably six years ago, five years ago now, I think Myra's on the call. Myra asked me, she was on the committee of committees and asked me to volunteer to be on the committees. And that was the most eye-opening thing I have ever seen. I mean, of the toxic structures in in you know the academy the awards blew my mind and so there is i think a lot to be said about the way that the award structures work and who they reward but i think it, we had this conversation at southern yesterday on a panel the awards really can help you pull out resources so you know it, it, for example i i won an award recently and i went immediately to the chancellor who has been doing all this diversity initiative and i was like here's how much money i want for the gender studies program we've got all these trans bills coming through the state legislature and i want you to commit this massive amount of money to trans programming and scholarships and i got it and, you know, I provided political cover for him because of achievement, but also he knows that all of there, there's all of this, you know, political backlash coming for him. And so it was the opportunity to match the thing with the money, right? What I didn't go and ask for was like cash for myself. I'm like, I wanted into the program for this specific thing and I want it to be permanent and hard funded. And so in terms of divestment investment, that's a permanent thing that there's been no trans anything at the University of Arkansas, like ever one time and there are space I think for white allies to divest that money into the places where people can use it so I mean that has happened in the last week which I think will be useful and I say that as somebody who directs a gender studies program that's never been run by a race scholar who's doing race gender work at the same time like these programs gender studies are mostly white women who are well-meaning second wave feminists who don't have critical edge about any decolonial perspectives or those sorts of things so to be having Having conversations about race and you know and and by POC stuff in my university is very new actually and there are opportunities there I think to help shift that conversation in a way towards divestment of their resources because they're they're under the gun now once they once everybody wrote all the DEI statements after George Floyd then there is political there's a political leverage to push back for cash money into the programs that need them to expand you know, services or research opportunities or support services or whatever. I mean, I think you make a, a good, uh, I think you make it pretty clear that part of being a good mentor is, is putting in the work. I, I think that there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes that goes into mentorship. And this is, this is from some of the, um, the materials we collected on the task force was, was to see just like what 
is one of the biggest barriers for folks to continue being a mentor. And usually that's a time and energy commitment. Um, they didn't realize that, that helping somebody connect to resources that have traditionally been denied to them takes, takes a sustained effort. And, and especially for larger um, you know, mentorship networks, the, these, these things have been denied to folks on purpose. And I think that we can see um, how institutional power um, is, is constantly trying to, to re, um, repossess that power, right? I think you make a great point about Arkansas. You look at what's happening in Georgia. You, you, you can't let your guard down as somebody who, who, who like hangs your hat on minor successes. Being a mentor is, is sort of like a long-term commitment with a, a lot of work and, and not a lot of like, you know, uh, returns. And I, and I think that that's something that folks should realize getting into mentoring relationships. I think of it as housework. Like I think of really activist work generally like housework, like it's never ending. There will always be more laundry and you have to get up and do it anyway because it's survival politics. And we're not in a position to think about it as a luxury. I mean, certainly down here in the South at all. And so, yeah, I think it's it's constant. I also, I wonder about mentees because there was, I, there was never a conversation about mentoring when I was in grad school or about how to be a good mentee. I'm sure I was not a good mentee. I came, I came in so angry and pissed off and fighty and, you know, burn it down. And then I read all of the stuff that I needed to write about and it made me more fighty and angry. So I've been thinking a lot about like good mentees and about how to think through menteeship, not just as a grad student because I, I have mentors still, right? Even though I'm <laughs> middle age. But what does it mean to be a good mentee, do you think? I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but it's, it takes work. It's a sustained effort. And and I think that you know people don't realize that the, the, the return is, is about how much you put into it. Um, I think that oftentimes um, you know, knowing what questions to ask is something that that seems really daunting to folks. I, I know this is, as a junior scholar, I, I, I'm a, this is the last decade of my life. It's, it's been how how to to try to create a, a network, a safe network, that um, you know makes me feel like I'm doing a, a good thing. Right? Uh, it, probably this goes back to the anxiety of competitiveness or the anxiety of of, of wanting to have this individual um, you know success, but at the same time, I would say um, it, it hasn't been easy and, and it hasn't been easy to, to find groups of mentors. And so, you know, um, it's it's hard and it takes a long time. And it, it really is about how much you put into to the relationships, you know. Yeah, I think what reciprocity, about you? reciprocity is a real thing, yeah. you know, even if it's not equal. Right. It's not going to be equal because power is real. But reciprocity is a thing I don't. I'm thinking about it right now in COVID because I've got a bunch of grad students who are just like, you know, a disaster, like everybody is a disaster. And, you know, I just, I don't know how many more ways to say ghosting destroys relationships and you can't do it. It's like not an option. And also hold space for all of the contingencies and disasters that are prompted by a mass extinction event. And so to your point, I think generosity is a really important important part of the mentoring relationship. And I think that's one thing we probably don't mentor enough. Like if, if it's a proportion between critique and generosity, critique, <laughs> critique is where we all hang our hats, but generosity is where, you know, we sustain the labor. So I guess I'm thinking a lot about that and about um, self-reflexivity and honesty with the self. Um, and also people, I think good mentors and mentees can have conversations about power, how to map power. You know, in politics, we call it power mapping. So you sit down, if you're helping an organization power map and think about all the key st strategic allies and blocks for getting your thing done. And then you map out strategies to appeal to them or to crush them. And I like the appealing. Sometimes I like the crushing, but on the whole, I prefer the appealing. And, um, you know, it just seems to me that good mentorship relationships can talk honestly about, you know, the I don't know, pitfalls and promises of anything, any project or collaboration. Like, you know, I'm far from perfect, <laughs> but, you know, I think, I think good mentors are open to mentorship opportunities, even if they haven't seen it modeled for them. I think that the patronage, the patronage model is a powerful drug. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people come into mentoring 
relationships thinking that they have you know to perform the same sort of traditional like um i, I guess what I'm, I'm 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 getting to is this idea of like how do we come into a community and I, we're not often taught how to come into a community and um i i'm just reminded of uh, of a scholar uh, her name is um isabel altamirano jimenez uh, an indigenous scholar who does environmental work and and she she talks about this idea of like a community being built around like who shows up, not like who your parents are. Um, I think that so often, and you, and you can see this even in indigenous scholars in the United States, really questioning this idea of blood quantum and questioning the idea of like belonging as based on like where you are from and like who your parents are genetically and, and really literally patronage, right? Um, and, and thinking about like who shows up for the community, who invests in the community and, and building identity based on those factors. So to me, in a relationship, in a mentoring relationship, this is not just about like um, the two people who are coming together, but this is about the thing that's being produced and built between them. And if, if in, a, in a perfect world, if we're doing constellation research, then uh, the mentee and the mentor um, are, are bringing in this, this understanding that what, what they're investing in is actually the environment, is actually the, 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 the thing that they're trying to build in, that, in, that they share, that they have, they can take resources from, that they can put resources into that like, that environment that we often call like a work environment or a department environment is, is literally that. It's a place where we go and we share and we contribute. So a toxic environment is one that people go in and trash. A, a sustainable environment is one that people go in and, and actually put in the work to do. And from there, I think relationships are built, community is built. So maybe this is getting into our third point, but building health, healthy mentoring relationships really seem to be about like building a healthy environment that everybody can take part of and, and, and add to. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, it's interesting because my grad students are like, well, I don't want to take so-and-so's class. I don't like so-and-so. And they talk about likability a lot. And I think about that because I am often not likable like many of us, right, who do critical work. Sometimes we're assholes. That's real. But also like Likeability is not the thing that gets the goal, right? Likeability doesn't bring down the cash money. Likeability doesn't shift the shitty white supremacist institution to do better. You know, likeability is not the thing that gets progressive work done. And I think about that a lot because I work with people all the time in politics that I don't like, that I would never make close relationships with and that who show up <laughs> and do the work. So it doesn't matter if I don't wanna be their friend or I wouldn't invite them to you know, hang out at my house or that I don't wanna meet their kids. If they show up, then there's an opportunity. I was in a panel yesterday with Andre Johnson, who I work with a lot, and he he was he was making, I think, a very powerful point point about you know doing the generosity to accept the people who are at the table and who want to learn and who want to grow and who continue to show up through the critique. And I think, especially since I get called on to herd the white ladies a lot, you know, the I joke that white women are like one panic attack away from calling the cops and getting somebody killed. Uh, only it's that's a sad joke, but it's true, and it's what I mean about the dysregulation that, you know, in terms of white people who want to do the work, it's, I think, if the opportunity is there to show up, then there's an obligation to do generosity about it, so long as harm is not being done, and there's a path for growth together, and, and that's not about harm, right, that's not about abuse, and that's not about exploitation, it's not about extractive capitalism, it's not about, you know, reproducing, you know, pain or trauma, but it is about knowing where the people are that are want to commit to the work. And I think good mentors can teach people how to map out the strategies for where there are folks who are amenable to do the work, regardless of, you know, the personalities and feelings. And so I, I think you're right about that. I think, you know, healthy mentorship relationships do not cause trauma. They fundamentally do not do that. Often they navigate trauma. They're responsive sometimes to trauma. They, you know, can tackle trauma, but I don't think that they should cause trauma. And I, you know, I like that trauma has entered the vocabulary since we've, you know, had this like psychological mindfuck for the last four years with Trump that, you know, that that vocabulary has entered into discourses critiquing liberalism more generally, even though, you know, psychology is a science, I think has room to grow. I think there is utility in seeing where the harm is and where the potential is to transform harm. You know, and I think good mentorship relationships can discuss and unfold 
you know, those, those ideas, honestly, I guess. Um, I, 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 as you say that, it made me think of um, the, the sort of relationship I built with a graduate student who's about to graduate from our program. Um, got to uh, go to her number one choice for grad school, uh, on a, you know, um, on a scholarship a fellowship. So um, I say this simply because uh, our relationship was never built on like, this is what you should do. It, it, it started with uh, what are you, what are you wanting from this? And um, a lot of, a lot of the, of the conversation, um, I'd say half of our, of our, of our conversation was, was literally about navigating the institution. It had very little to do with like her academic prowess or the method or the theory that she wanted to use, but it was, it was literally all about as a new scholar in, at, at my school and as a second year grad student, like how, how can I help you and how can you help me sort of like navigate these channels? Um, humility has a lot to do with it. And I think that re recognizing that like um, somebody who, you know, doesn't have the degree that I have, but somebody who has a lot of, of worldly knowledge about navigating um, new situations really taught me more than, than I think I, I taught her in that sort of like patronage model. Um, but on top of that, what, what sort of like is, is to me the, the, the crux of this, this mentorship argument or this, this thing I'm trying to suggest to you all is, is, is that it's not just about her and I, it was about the betterment of the entire department, right? Um, each one of her letters of recommendation from folks was about how she took it upon herself to mentor other um, graduate students, to, to uplift the graduate students that like um, were in precarious positions because of the uh, pandemic and whatnot, like organizing online meetings of just supporting each other, right? This didn't come from me, but it also didn't necessarily come on her own. I think her understanding and being able to recognize what was needed and then use her leverage, uh, use her institutional power to leverage that into like materialization and then getting me to jump on board was, was an example of how when, when we de-individualize ourselves and we like cut ourselves off from, from our own success and, and start thinking about what we can build as a community. I mean, it sounds like a hippy dippy shit, but really it, it, it is about how we build better environments that are just conducive to awesome relationships across the board. I want to say that this is both incredible what you're saying. Um, I, I'm taking lots of notes as you're talking. And um, I think this, my question speaks to um, what both of you have been saying, Lisa and Michael. Um, and, and Lisa specifically, um, you had talked about the difference between likability and uh, I, I guess uh, healthy mentorship and that those two aren't necessarily the same thing. And where my question is coming from is um, kind of informed by Michelle Holling's work on you intimidate me and how women of color or people of color or women, various um, uh, folk who are portrayed and framed as being inherently hostile, uh, no matter how they communicate. And as you said before, you're like, I'm a critical scholar. I'm, I'm not going to be liked if I'm pointing out things. Um, how if you can speak a little bit more on that relationship, that tension, and how can we see that kind of critical work that you and Michael are doing as an act of care, if you will. And maybe that's not the language you would use, but just thoughts. Yeah, so I love that essay. I teach that essay. And obviously I wrote a book that's about how white people can't hear <laughs> black words about feelings. So, I mean, white people cannot hear people of color describing feelings as they are political. Like that is clearly where my research is right now. But I think it's important to separate style, right? Like I do politics. So there is no world for me to be feminine style in the South to do politics. That's like, that is not a thing. I can also do politics and have an agonistic political style and do humility and generosity and produce resources and, you know, work in collaboration. And I think for me, we don't often can't distinguish between style and, and the showing up part, right? So it, the style cannot be more important than like, I was just thinking about DEI, I've been doing a bunch of DEI talks, right, about what is DEI on my campus and in the conferences and, blah, and stuff like that. And so it's like, I think about how many people of color have I published? 
how many of their books have I favorably reviewed to publication? I almost exclusively just do promotion and tenure. I did five tenure cases last year, only of people of color. How many DEI committees do I exact cash money, blood money out of my slave institution that's on the trail of tears? How many awards committees have I, you know, maneuvered people of color into the award? How many grad committees have I sat on as the only race, gender, scholar in my PWI? You know, how many students of color or queer students have I professionalized into jobs? I mean, that is, the, you know, in terms of like legacy or like evidence of success as a mentor, I'm way more interested in like, how are you creating sustainable networks that can build healthy relationships over the long term, rather than I am concerned about the style of the politics of the person, especially given how you know, that language of agonism permeates our discipline in particular, like the style question for me, I'm just happy to accept all of the styles as long as we're all just like, you know, building in the same direction. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't know, Michael, you want to tag in on that, uh, your thoughts? You're muted, hon. I was going to say, uh... Well, there's, there's a Q&A question that I think kind of fits in, into this idea, um, but, but I, I would just simply say that um, likability is, is a quality that we like want when we're online dating. And I think that like, this is work. And, and what we do is hard work. And what we do is work that doesn't necessarily get us likability points, but it has the potential to create spaces that are more equitable, that can even elevates like public policy or, or at least public attention on, on things that really matter to us. Um, obviously, that this is something that for women, especially um, women of color, BIPOC women, especially femme, uh, queer folks, this is this is obviously the, 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 the norm that white supremacy and that patriarchy will constantly leverage its like moodiness against the people that it doesn't like. Um, as somebody who benefits from privilege, um, but also is on the, the receiving end of criticism for being vocal, I think that we can um, just back away, dis disengage from questions of personality and, and start engaging in, in practical um, questions of, of environment building. Um, and I say this about environment building again, like the Department of Environments, but I'm actually literally talking about how, how can we turn our attention to like some of the biggest questions facing humanity in, in like uh, environmental catastrophe has to be something that we're all attuned to. Uh, I, I was also saying uh, while I was muted that um, there's a, a comment uh, or a, somebody who, who in the Q&A asked if um, we have any suggestions for how mentors can best try to deal with being mobbed or bullied both by faculty and grad students for not playing the, the patronage game. Uh, Lisa, what do you think about that? Yeah, I have lots of suggestions about this. So if we're taking notes, this is the part where I want to, I would love to get instructory. So uh, bullies thrive on negative attention. So you have, it's like an air supply. So you have to find ways to cut that off, right? And so I think it's really important to be able to practice and deliver deadpan. Um, I, part of that is because I'm like a failed comedian who never tried to be a comedian, but would have probably preferred that as the lifestyle over being an academic, if I'm totally honest, but delivering information in a deadpan cuts off the affective negative cycle that dysregulates narcissists and other mob, mob, you know, mobsters and bullies. So you've got to stop reinforcing the affective cycle that they're feeding on. Um, I think it's also really important to think about external leverage. So for when I have students who are in precarious positions or junior faculty members that I mentor across the country, even though they're not in my institution, I'm like, you have got to create external networks of accountability for the people who are mobbing. So that means that you have to, you have to appear and be in network with people who will do accountability on your behalf. Right. So like people who are doing panels with senior people who do, you know, race work or radical gender work or class work or whatever, 
they provide an accountability check on the bullies because they're in the same, they're at the same level of their career, they're in the same network. So they can flex in ways that junior people or people in preca more precarious positions can't. So, and that happens on campuses too. So I see it all the time with precarious faculty member who are junior faculty. If you can, if you can collaborate across campus and across units, especially with people higher up in the chain who are in, interested in the work that you're doing, it can help insulate you from the consequences of mobbing. That being said, I don't know anybody who does critical race gender work who is not mobbed or bullied. I've never seen anybody not have that. I've certainly had it. I, I've, it they're like unicorns. I don't think you can do critical race gender work and not be victimized by the bully stuff. It is a feature of the patronage model, which is how the entire publication cycle works in higher ed. So it's not, you can't take it personally, right? Because it is actually not personal, it's so totally structural. And so, and I would also say, I mean, you know, it, the therapeutic thing is not a solution to structural violence, but it, you, there has to be a way to, you know, manage the effects of toxic workplaces in the moment. And so mental health care, you know, if you can access it, get as much as you can, because it really does take a village to, to, to I think of it as explosives, you're defusing explosives and higher ed, the data is very clear. It attracts more narcissists than almost any other field other than surgeons also and police police officers you know there are tons of narcissists who are doing toxic behaviors so there's a there's a lot of great research on narcissists and workplace mobbing and the kind of bullying and gossip and tearing down and disparaging and undermining that i, I think a lot of us have been subjected subjected to across their careers i would also say that you know, creating these kinds of caring, durable networks that Michael and I are talking about is the way to produce the actual social resilience that create a different kind of environment. But that's a long-term project and not a short-term cure. Michael, what do you think about that? Um, I agree 100% about, about this idea that um, negative attention sort of like is, is what fuels a, a lot of the behavior that, that goes into bullying. I mean, it's attention. And that means in our field, e even a little bit of attention is, you know, can go on your CV, I guess. I don't know. The, the, the one thing I think of um, in this case is, is an article that my partner shared recently with me about grievances and how people can become addicted to airing their grievances or, or just like there, there's a, there's a, a this is not to pathologize anybody or to, or to pathologize the field in general, but but we 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 have this this idea that if we just express grievances over and over and over again, that somehow change will manifest. And it's actually just like a dopamine response. It's actually just like somebody feeling better, literally about themselves, because they're airing grievances about things. I don't think this is this is the spirit of criticism. I don't think this is why criticism was you know brought to our field and, and I'm hoping that we can sort of move you know move beyond that so one of the strategies that, that I see um, and, and talking more about that network especially is like having a process to like vaporize grievances to bring the grievances to, to, to fruition to allow folks to have a dialogue about the merit of those grievances this is not to say that grievances aren't aren't valuable or that they don't have you know a merit but if anything what, what grievances offer us is an invitation to create a better environment because the environment's not serving everybody. If, if we can have this mentality about the way we think about the, the shared space of where we are, the, the community that we, we wanna build, then, then grievances become more about invitations to think together instead of like self-serving, like dopamine responses. Uh, I guess that's all I would say about that. I think that's one of the things I've been most encouraged about since what I call the troubles of 2019 is that all of the special issues and all of the, the conference panels and these kinds of conferences have produced all of these alt spaces for collaboration to bring people together who want to do, who self-identify as wanting to do transformational work together. And I think there's value in that because it demonstrates that, you know, the scarcity mindset is, is often bullshit and there's more abundance than we can imagine. 
again, that's not to say that there aren't structural constraints on where the resources go. That's like a prima facie fact. However, we can do the work together to create alternative spaces outside of that patronage network to help each other thrive and to socially promote each other so we can transform, you know, our institutions and our communities. And I think, you know, there is so much work to do. I mean, like there's so much, there's so much trashy behavior and structural oppression, like all hands on deck, the more the merrier, please come and do the work, you know? And I think that if we can do, just like you say, that kind of call in for collaboration, that that's the path forward is thinking through, like, there's so much work to do. There's an abundance, you know, and now there's more concern than ever. Like, how do we produce durable spaces to continue the work to keep building, you know? I think it's, it's interesting that you can, you can see it happening on a, on a, maybe in a different sort of realm. But you know, you 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 don't leave certain people alone with other people. You 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 have this idea of, of watching out for folks, especially folks who, who you've made like a, a small cohort with. I remember my first years at University of Minnesota. Uh, my first year at the University of Minnesota, I, I came in with a couple of folks, and we, you know, ha had a tight bond that allowed us to sort of like you know, navigate some of the, the heavier stuff that was happening institutionally. And I think that that spirit of, of care, that spirit of, of just like compassion for, for the other folks, um, it goes a long way when we're talking about peers. Um, this is not to say that it's easy to make friends or they're easy to find peers in your institution, but I think, you know, one of the things you said, Lisa, is like building coalitions across campus, trying to find folks in similar positions, but maybe not in your department. Or, you know, I, I think that virtually now we have been so connected with one another, our, our networks are are now a touch away, and we can really use some of these technologies uh, that we've had to develop under COVID to, to build like peer networks that are that are really trying to move away from patronage, that are really trying to move away from the like the bullying, mobbing, and I think um, I would add control to that list, right? Like uh, even as far as like gaslighting and and giving folks wrong information about themselves or, or making graduate students feel like they're not prepared for something because we want them to do things the way we we have envisioned you know all of these things i think will, will will sort of like go away if if folks can can just think about caring for the others and caring for the the, the space that they share i think that's right on and i think a lot of times that care is articulated through control like the patronage network wants the care language, especially from white women, um, but then it demands it of people of color, right? It demands it even though it, it rejects it, that the care often comes as control. And I think we need to disaggregate those two things and understand that concern trolling is not actual care, <laughs> right? So like just vapid expressions of concern that are meant to discipline people right is not actually care but i think it often comes that way i also think i you know i have a 10 year old and so i think a lot about how you know how justice -y concepts get operationalized to children and so you know there's this idea of the friendship bench which i absolutely love that if you sit on the friendship bench then somebody's got to come over and friend you and so i sort of feel that way like you know, if I see people who are alone at a conference, especially grad students who are like, I'm here for the first time and I don't know, I'll just scoop them up. Just scoop them and be like, we're going to dinner. I, my name is Lisa. I saw you at the panel. Just come with us. These are the people, you know, meet them. And then, and I think that that is useful, right? That you don't just have to squad up with your institution, that it's actually really valuable to be institutionally promiscuous that way, because I think it helps us provide a check against really shitty, you know, advisor um, advice that is asymmetrical and controlling and often poisonous, especially when the relationship is toxic. So I think it's useful to have verifiable data from multiple perspectives outside of the institution to think through what, what advice one may be getting, especially when there are resources involved, like especially for junior faculty and, and graduate students, it's like you should not be making decisions about cash money or time if you don't have other people that you've talked to other than a mentor, particularly if that mentorship relationship is contentious. And I'll add to that too, that um, I, I love the, 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 the friendship bench idea or, or the, the like conscious scooping up of folks who seem like they're in search of like some connection. Because um, I think for, 
particularly, you know, I'll just speak to my experience as like a first generation, um, you know, student who um, is visibly not white and is like um, kind of shy and, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll add like I couldn't really read well until I got to college. So I, I had um, undiagnosed um, issues. But the, the thing that it, all of this is I would not have gotten to where I am had I not had a scooper, had I not had somebody who just kind of came alongside and, and, and intentionally tried to make it feel more comfortable for me, right? Um, to avoid being a savior and to avoid the like, wanting to like uplift everybody i think what we could sort of operationalize this is 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 really just doing outreach making yourself available like wearing a pin that says come talk to me you know it's not necessarily about saving folks but about putting yourself out there in a way um, that lets people know that you're communicable you know i have colleagues that have open door policies and this is over the years this isn't just my institution now but but they're not open they're not you know willing unless the, the person kisses the ring i think um, I, I've, I've seen it the opposite too. I've seen folks who um, will intentionally go out of their way to, to befriend other people. Um, while I was at the University of Denver, you know, I had professors and other folks would just introduce me to folks that they think I should know almost to the point where like, I can't even remember all these people's names, but, but sure enough, just like mass introductions to people allowed, allowed me to start a network of people that I wanted to, to be around, you know. Um, I, I say all this to say is like, um, if you see an opportunity to, to, to bring somebody into a community or to build a connection that isn't there, consider that especially for um, BIPOC scholars and especially for international scholars and especially for queer scholars, these are things that um, go a long way. Yeah, I had this a couple of, I don't know, probably five weeks ago now, a graduate student of color at a different institution hollered at me on Twitter, got into a Twitter, Twitter conversation and was like, can I talk to you about this more? I have like lots of these mentoring questions. I was like, sure. And he was like, okay, well, my friends have them too. I was like, why don't we do a webinar? Just like bring them. And I made my press, I mean, made, I asked my press to host and they were like, sure. And I'm like, now you have a Vita line, whatever, ask, bring whoever you want, ask me whatever you want. We'll record it, we'll put it on the internet, make it a Vita line. You know, I could have done that privately and that would have been fine with me, right? And it didn't matter to me either way. I just gave him the option. But I'm like, here is a way to amplify you and to get your people to come and ask whatever questions you think that I can help with. And I mean, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Everybody knows who I am already. I don't get anything from, there's no cash exchanged or whatever. I'm like, if I'm going to make myself available, bring your folks along, whoever you want to bring, let's hang out, whatever. And I think I mean, that works for me as a style thing because I'm a raging extrovert, right? So the public speaking is obviously my jam. And so not everybody can do that. But I think that even if you have a different style, certainly than mine, there are opportunities to just like bring along people, right? Bring along people who are not at your not at your level in the academy. Bring along people who are not necessarily your kind of institution. Like just bring them along and build with them where they're at because they're not all where you're at. I think I think things things like normalizing, celebrating other people's accomplishments. I mean, we should we should host a, I don't know, a, a seminar at one of our conferences soon about how to like post a social media post about somebody else's accomplishments, right? How to, especially if somebody who you're mentoring, somebody who's a grad student, somebody who uh, you know wouldn't shout themselves out, but but really is doing good work. You know, um, I think that maybe building connections or, or having um, some way for us to like throw other ideas out there about like, hey, I have, a, I have a friend who's doing good work. Can somebody work with them? I mean, normalizing, talking about what other people are doing is, is one way to do that. Um, like limiting, celebrating yourself um, is, is important. Um, obviously for folks of color and obviously for, for folks who I think are, you know, tuned into this kind of conference, um, celebrating yourself, don't, don't stop doing that. But also celebrate other people, celebrate the community that you're part of, celebrate your department, celebrate your university, even though it's not perfect, right? Normalizing, like investing in, in the shared community, like, I don't know, host a, a trash pickup on campus in your department, because literally you're just making the place that you all are sharing space a better place. I think that simple, simple things that kind of tune you to other people in your, like, in your community are, are, 
are really small. They, 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 they take very little to do, but they can go a long way. Yeah, I think the volunteerism and community service need to be a greater part of what the communication discipline understands is a thing that we do together. Like in our institute, you and I talked about this a little bit on the front end to plan this talk, but I think you're that you're absolutely right that there are, there are a lot more things that we could be doing together that are not about writing articles for the journal or managing course enrollment that are beneficial for the community and also beneficial for our relationships. I think that's a missed opportunity for communication scholars in particular right especially those of us who are interested in you know public deliberation or social engagement or critical work in the community i think you're absolutely right um i i'm reminded of a of a project that one of my colleagues uh dr jaden de maria um proposed in one of uh i think last year's um faculty meetings but i i actually think that this is something we should do here and we and everybody should do anywhere is um taking grad students and giving them a one-hour course about the location that they're going to. I mean, many of the folks, especially who uh, go to larger programs will go to those programs not having known anything about the people of the land, the land itself, the way that the land has been colonized and exploited and, and simply engaging folks with like where they are and, and trying to get them in, into a, an understanding of like how their impact as students, as graduate students especially, are changing the nature of the land and the way that it's used and then there's actually efforts by people who have stewarded that land for centuries who are trying to continue that and you can participate in that, right? Those efforts would, would just go a long way towards building a mentorship network that isn't focused on like patronage, but I think is focused on really building a shared environment, uh, a network around um, construction and not destruction. It's interesting because when I got to Arkansas, we had this thing. I don't know if it will survive COVID. I hope that it does. But um, all the new faculty went on a two day bus tour, two night bus tour around the entire state of Arkansas with the chancellor and with like an Arkansas historian and like whatever people who know stuff about Arkansas, right? An ecologist and schwa, schwa, schwa. And they spent three days together right before orientation learning about the geography and economy and history of the state. And I always thought that was really useful given that like 50% of our students come from Arkansas and the people who teach here don't for the most part. So it's like, this is like, this is the poverty. This is the segregation. This is the lack of financial investment from the feds. This is the land management, mismanagement, blah, blah, blah. This is colonialism. Because I feel like it gave them access to thinking about Arkansas where their students would be like, I'm from, you know, whatever, you know, Jonesboro. And they'll be like, oh yeah, we went there and I know blah, blah, blah about this. So they, they had some contact with huge swaths of the state where the, it created at least, you know, that moment of contact with the student that they would not have had otherwise when they came from their cosmopolitan campus in some other place. And so, yeah, I think space and place is important. I, I really hope that it withstands, that that bus tour withstands COVID and, and that happens again when we all get back to campus. Yeah. Um, it looks like we have a, a question um, in the Q&A. Robert, did you do that? Question. Yeah, so the question, I'll just uh, read it so everybody um, is aware of it, but what are some helpful ways to disrupt proxy wars where faculty attack other faculty through their grad student advisees and mentees? I don't know, Lisa or Michael, if you'd like to take that. Asymmetrical warfare produces inequalities. It's real. Um, that's, I think, you know, I think the thing that you have to do there is reverse engineer the graduate student relationships. Right. So that means graduate student happy hour, graduate student, you know, event planning out where the faculty are not present so that the relationship building happens among the graduate students. I mean, it's sort of Paolo Freire, right, that the, the, the pedagogy of the oppressed have to reproduce structures among the oppressed to survive. I think that faculty also have a role in disrupting that trash behavior. So, you know, if we're talking from the graduate perspective, I think that you have to build alternative relationships and alternative modalities of positive caring relationships outside of that. 
Um, but I also think that faculty have got to stop that. I mean, it, it, at this point, it is absolutely inconscien unconscionable to allow that kind of behavior to happen. You know, our departments are not that big. So that damage lasts and lasts and gets reproduced. So I think socializing, even with the graduate students, I also would say that the graduate students feel like they're held hostage in those situations. And so it is sort of a hostage negotiation, you know, situation because they feel like they can't get out because the egos are so fragile and the people are so volatile. And so um, some of you live in states that have unions, so ombuds people are available to you to troubleshoot that and talk through the particular personalities, you know, in the right to work states, we have nothing like that. You know, we're sort of on our own to negotiate it. But I would also say, at least on most campuses, at least on mine, that you know there are faculty who know the personalities and who can teach you where the bodies are buried and where the, you know, the landmines are to help you navigate those things. And it's useful to find out who actually holds the power map, who can talk cogently about, you know, how to defuse particular bombs in your department and how to how to skirt them. You know, uh, maybe you can take the methods class in the summer. Or maybe some, and you generally it's useful to find precedent. So if somebody got to skip this, skip around this obstacle one time, then you can do it, right? So I would say leverage, leverage precedent, leverage bylaws and any kind of policy documents, right? To get around or through or beyond a thing. Um, I would say that naming things helps, right? Like with any kind of abuse, naming something as workplace mobbing, naming it as a proxy war, naming it as a workplace, you know, harassment, that is helpful in describing a phenomenon that is often goes undescribed, right? And also collegiality is part of the way that we all, a lot of us get, you know, um, evaluated. And so using weaponizing the language of inclusivity in your university and department uh, sometimes is advantageous. Sometimes it cuts against you and you have to weigh the cost risk there. But I think that especially now in the DEI climate that we're in, it is more those resources, weaponizing the DEI stuff to create space for marginalized students and faculty members is more possible now than certainly when I was younger. Michael, what do you think about this? Yeah, as, as somebody who has had to make a couple of equal opportunity claims, um, I think that it's, it's just really important to keep track of all of these and not only to keep track of the facts of what happened, but what you have been feeling as a result of these, how it's impacted your work. Keep, keep very detailed notes about the ways in which these intentional acts on behalf of other people are, are disrupting what would otherwise be a normal flow, a, a normal you know, work life. Because I think that's the purpose of this. I think the purpose of proxy wars and the, pro the purpose of, of these sort of like attacks tend to be about disruption, tend to be about n not necessarily agreeing or being on board with uh, your work. And let's just face it. I mean, there, there aren't three colors of the diversity rainbow and there, there aren't just three ways by which we tackle critical race or gender issues. I mean, there, there's many ways in which people do similar work, but just do it differently. And if somebody's victimizing you because of that, then you, you, you need to make it very clear to the people who write your paychecks that this is happening to you and it's affecting your work. Um, having that record and then um, continuing to keep records is, is for me the, the number one piece of advice that I would give. Um, the second piece of advice I would give is if this is making you feel unsafe, if this is making you feel as if like you, you, your physical safety uh, may, may be a risk, you know, make it a point to bring it to the, to the people who, uh, again, are, are either your, the chair of your department or the person who's, who's your supervisor to, to let them know that and to find ways to remove yourself from those individuals who, who might be causing this trauma, because that's what it is, trauma. I would also say that one perspective that I think that I took, especially on the tenure track, was to, to think through how useful it was for me to understand that I need to make it very expensive for anybody to fuck with me inside of my institution. So when I went up for tenure, I do all of this political stuff. It's very, very public. 
but also, you know, people don't like the critical race sex gender work. So uh, when I put my tenure dossier in, I had all of these politicos from all across the state write letters. And I just created a separate folder in the Dropbox that went in as part of my permanent file. I doubt anybody ever read it, but also it's all there. So there's no plausible deniability, deniability like we didn't know what Corrigan was doing. We had no idea she was doing X, Y, and Z. Yes, you did. And it's part of the permanent record. And here's the, you know, permanent URL for it. So I think you, you know, want to think about how to make it expensive for people to produce harm. And I think that's the case, you know, you, you, we can do it individually. Obviously, I have more privilege to do that as a white chick. But, you know, we can also do it collectively, right? So where we're creating, you know, networks of people who will push back against that together and call it out. You know, one of the things, amplification is a strategy that a lot of the staffers in the Obama administration talk about is the women of color when somebody would take credit for their ideas, when some white dude would jump in and say the same thing and then get credit. And so they started amplifying each other. And so it's like, oh, I really love what Marsha said. That was a great idea. And then somebody else would be like, I also like what Marsha said. That was a great idea. And so amplification, I think, creates a very different dynamic um, in a graduate program if there are people on board and they can also see that the workplace mobbing or the harassment, you know, or the proxy wars are actually what's happening. And I think that it helps to have people who have you know, stake in that and disrupting that, like they're the best collaborators and co-conspirators and also manage expectations because some people just straight do not have the fortitude to manage that kind of, you know, power struggle while they're in grad school for a whole host of reasons that have nothing to do with their own temperament or whatever, but not everybody is a, a useful ally. I will also say one more thing. I get asked by a lot of junior faculty about this kind of stuff. And I say to them, you know, dysregulated colleagues colleagues, you know, are going to produce more chaos for you than regulated colleagues, regardless of whether they're white or not, or whether they're straight or not. And so sometimes there are unlikely allies that come in very, you know, normalized bodies that can do, can do really good protective work for you on that count, because they have durable relationships with people who can check those bullies. So, you know, understand that, you know, allies do actually come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And the ones who can speak the language of power inside of the institution can also undermine those folks who are producing trauma. That's what I would say. If, if I can um, ask a question that builds upon this, and again, I love what you're, you're both saying, um, Lisa, especially the dysregulated bodies, Michael uh, documenting. Um, I, I'm not asking either of you to disclose anything you don't feel comfortable with. That's not the point of my question, but um, if you're in the discipline, you've dealt with dysregulated bodies, um, uh, some of us more than we would like, um, some of us fortunate to less than, than um, others. So my question is, is for those people um, here or who watch later who are in the thick of it, they're engaged with uh, an abusive relationship in terms of either they're at the center of a proxy war, um, a toxic mentor, um, you've given good advice in terms of power mapping, in terms of documenting. Um, how do you address the fear that you might experience in terms of taking action in and of itself. Do you have any advice of that? If that's if my question is making sense. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a real fear, and there's a real fear of, of being being re-traumatized. Um, I think especially for people, um, we've talked about people from precarious positions uh, have dealt with trauma, probably um, more more than let's say our our standard you know, white boy student from, you know, the Midwest, right? I'm, I'm not trying to generalize, but I'm what I'm trying to say is like trauma is, is distributed unequally and it's usually distributed to black and brown bodies and women and queer folks more. Um, I'm saying that because for me, trauma and, and navigating trauma is not something we learn or something we know about or something that we, we even think about when we're, when we're trying to get a humanities degree, but it's something that definitely informs our work. In fact, I would say that the majority of critical scholars who are producing work in our field, in our major journals, are just writing about trauma, their trauma, somebody else's trauma, and how that trauma has been communicated or why it happened because of somebody else's communication. Really, we, we deal in trauma and we, we have a very small vocabulary to be able to deal with trauma. So for, from, for somebody who is experiencing trauma, 
the, the worst thing that we can do is just say, well, that's part of the institution. That's what I went through. You know, that's what all my colleagues went through. So you'll get through it. No, I mean, telling somebody who's experiencing trauma that they'll just get through it or that everything's going to be fine once they get on the other side is, is further producing or at least just capitulating to the, the traumatization of folks who are already being traumatized. I think that we need to honor folks when they say that they feel afraid, that we need to listen to folks, that when they say somebody in a position of power, and I'm not talking uh, just about like socio and political power, but I'm talking about like in a position of like institutional power, an associate and professor talking to an assistant, assistant professor talking to graduate students, anybody talking to undergraduates, that that that, that sort of mechanism is, is um, taught, trained up front, is that folks are traumatized, we're all traumatized. I mean, God, in the last year, who, who hasn't experienced multiple traumas? And I think that if we start from a, a position of compassion rather than a position of correction, then we as educators, the people who have to step up after the revolutionaries kind of like leave, are, are equipped to, to deal with trauma that is left in the wake of those things. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I don't know that I have anything more substantial to add, except to say that we don't all have the same risk thresholds for a whole host of reasons. And so it is very important, I think, to know yours. Like as a white person, I know I can say a bunch more stuff in my white institution that will allow me to get resources for communities that need them and the likelihood that I'm going to be fired as minimal. That being said, I mean, the firing squad has totally come for me to, to try and, and stop my promotions or whatever. So, you know, I just assumed from the jump that I would get fired at some point. And I just use that as this, like the baseline for understanding that this is just a job. I understand that people under, that like invest, obviously I invested shitloads of resources into this, whatever PhD, but I also cultivated a bunch of skill sets so that I could always walk away. When I was very young, I read something about always have a fuck you fund, right? So you had money squirreled away so you could just walk out of a job. Right, because like many of you, I worked terrible jobs that were super inhumane and brutal. And so I feel the same way now. So now that I'm older, I can take bigger risks, right? Because I've built all of these accountability structures external to me that will help support that work and sort of negate the disincentivized punishment that will come. But not everybody's risk threshold is the same. I certainly don't expect everybody to be able to do that you know, kind of work. But for me, I think it was useful to just be like, it is very possible that through no fault of my own or through a direct consequence of my actions, I could be fired at some point. And so, you know, as a poor kid, I always have a backup plan, just assuming that that's a possibility that could happen. It doesn't loom and it doesn't produce anxiety for me because I've already accepted it as a possible outcome in the history of my life. People get fired. It's super normal. But because I think people get siloed and they exist in very tiny networks inside of higher ed, it makes it seem like other possibilities for existing don't exist. Also, Michael said something that I thought was really great when we were planning this. He's, he, we were talking about safety and, and Michael, you I don't know, you might have remembered this. You were saying, don't risk your safety for an opportunity right? Whether it's your physical, mental, or emotional safety. And I think that's the risk threshold that people need to know where they're at on is when can you take the risk and when can you not, when can you try out some risk taking where the threshold is lower so that you can see sort of where your line is in the sand. And this just goes back to the, the research on mentoring. People take risks when they have a supported network. People, could, people take risks when they know that there's a there's a safety net if they take that jump. I mean, if you're if you're already part of a network that's looking out for your best interests, then then yeah, it, it might be okay to do that. But when you feel isolated, and when you feel isolated by people who you think are providing you connection, then taking risks is something that you you very rarely will do without you know the authorization of, of that person. It's it's controlling, and it, it me it seems um, you know like there there are you know the, the I think Robert said it earlier, but I think there are correlations between like abusive relationships and abusive mentoring relationships that that we can see are are, are oftentimes based in narcissism, insecurity, and, and sometimes um, will will bring down a whole uh, you know family in that regard. 
And I think we have another question here, Michael, maybe you can take a crack at it. How, how have you decided when working through policy creation, revision, leveraging, is it helpful or limiting? And what do you see as the relationship between policy structures, et cetera, and cultural change? Maybe you could take the first crack at that. Sure. Um, I, I, I had the opportunity to see Claudia Rankin give a speech um, a couple of years back. And one of the, it was a great question from the audience, but one of the questions is like, so, so what can we do about this? And uh, you know, Professor Rankin's question was, I think, spot on. It's, it's that, yeah, we can pick off the people who are doing these things to us left and right, but does that change the institution? No. I mean, we, we have a lot to be angry about, and we can certainly you know, feel angry when, when somebody does or says something to us that we feel is, is wrong. But then I, I think that the culmination of all those angers that we have for those individuals should we or could we leverage it against you know the institution through leveraging policies or through leveraging our uh, positions and of course like i think lisa points out some of us have stronger positions in our institutions but that doesn't mean that we, we can at least attempt to do the, the the things that we can right my, my um, position as a grad student is what allowed me actually to develop a class because i was also working at the english language center but I wasn't a faculty member at the University of Denver. So when I brought the grievance as a member of the student body in front of the uh, you know, administration backed up by the National Labor Board, they, they can't remove a student, but they could certainly remove an adjunct faculty who's trying to like start a labor war. To me, understanding what your capacity is, understanding like what your limits are, um, I think allows you to really go after policies and structures. In fact, going after people, you, you leave a lot of bodies, but you don't really change much about what's going on, in my opinion. Yeah, I'll co-sign that. I, you know, the political brain in me is like all about using the words against the people who make them, right? So I think that it's very valuable to understand how policies and procedure work. I have seen so much stuff railroaded with Robert's rules. I mean, like so much. I mean, if anybody's ever served on LA in the NCA or ICA, you have seen, you know, how policies and procedures constrain or produce opportunity. So I think it's it, that, you know, there's just this whole invisible side of the academy and all of these skill sets that we are not training people to be able to be fluent in. And the language of power works through policy. And so you can be into that as a part of your, you know, work, or you can be not into that. But at the end of the day, we all work for the most part in giant white institutions. And if you don't have people in your coalition that speak that language and can crack that code, and can, you know, break it open so that the cash money pours out and the thing changes, you're going to keep just trying to roll that boulder up the hill. Like there's, there is no other way to move in coalition except to, you know, push through that. And it is an entire linguistic structure of power that I think it's, you have to have people in your coalitions that can do that, whether it's you or not is fi fine, right? Because that's, there's plenty of work to go around. But if the goal for me is divestment, then you have to have people who can do that and, you know, crack open the nut and get all of that, you know, money out or whatever, the resources, the tenure lines, the whatever it is that your goals are, to, whatever you're moving towards. Uh, I'll add to that too, that um, as, as an educator, right, as somebody in uh, an institution whose job is to educate, like our, our potential to be a liaison between students and resources that get change made, I think is just, it's so undervalued, uh, right? Um, I tell this to my students all the time. I was like, if you want something to change at the institution, you're talking to the wrong person. You are the one who is like, uh, paying everybody's bills. And so the moment you complain as a student, things will get done. And, and students tend to realize, oh, wait, that's cool. But then you tell them, if five of you complain about the same thing at the same time, you'd be surprised at how quickly some, something changes. And, and that, that is just true, I think, across the board, right? Know, know who has the power in the institution, who, who's the one who's valued, and then be the person who can, who can make those connections. Um, in this case, coalition is not is not a, a hero movie. It's not about like the one person standing at the end. It's it's literally about undoing that mentality. It's about undoing the idea that there's one group who 
or one person or one type of person that, that is, is going to continually be on top. We, we really need to move away from that. And it's, it's, to me, that's the patronage model is, is always having the hierarchy. Um, another thing that you said that, that I love, and I, I always make a metaphor to my students also, is, is about the, the work that it takes to understand the policies that you're trying to change. I think there's a lot of, a lot of people who, again, the revolutionaries, they would really like to go in there and blow the thing up. But if you don't know how the thing is working, and if you don't understand how to even get inside of the thing in the first place, you know, all of those efforts at like shooting at the wall is not going to bring down the wall. So I use the metaphor of the Death Star, right? Like the, the rebel forces spent a lot of time acquiring the plans and studying the plans of the Death Star. They didn't just send a bunch of like photon lasers at the, no, they knew exactly where it, it, its weaknesses were. And I think that all of the work happened before that one shot was fired. All of the work happened before um, going in there, knowing exactly where to break that system apart. And, and if you want to crack it, then you're not going to do it in your vehemence and your anger and like how mad you are when that happens, it's going to go into the preparation. I love the Star Wars analogy, I just want to say. Um, I, I did have a, a question. Um, I know uh, it's something that you've kind of touched upon, but I think, um, you know, knowing that we're, we have about 30 minutes left and there's still so much to discuss and thinking about what are the, the really um, uh, tangible things that, that you've all been talking about, but tangible things in terms of uh, mentorship. And the question I have for you is, um, if you can speak a little bit to what are the red flags of bad mentorship relationships, like really to, because, you know, when we've been talking about, and that Michael, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the, the fruits of patronage um, are a drug, you know, it, it, it's toxic, but it seems so tempting for some people. And so what, what are the red flags we should look out for so we don't fall into this trap and realize where we are when it's too late? Um, I mean, that's hard, right? Um, we, we work in an industry where our identities are highly curated, where we, we don't necessarily know how somebody is or who somebody is until you get to know them. Um, and oftentimes we will look past somebody's personality or look past somebody's um, idiosyncrasies, let's call them, because we know that there's like a material gain if I work with that person or if this person works with me and, and so on. To me, one of the, the biggest red flags that I see in these is, is the sort of like uh, quid pro quo. If, if you're entering into a relationship where you're as a mentee being asked to provide stuff on behalf of the mentor, to me, that's a red flag. That, that would be the where I would start. What about you, Lisa? Yeah, no, I love that. That's totally true. I mean, I, um, I think if it feels exploitative, it is. I think too that the people who manage the best in the academy can f know who their what their values are and know where their point of no return is ethically. And so the more ethically grounded you are in your own, you know, ethical framework, the more material that you have to ground the decisions that you make as you run up against, you know, exploitative colleagues and mentors who are just going to extract like just frack ideas out of you. So I would say that's a thing. I also think strategic ambiguity cannot be overrated. I think it's, you know, especially for me, when I got my first job, I totally downplayed, like, I don't know, the kind of career that I wanted to have. And, you know, I tried not to be as extra, you know, <laughs> as I think I am now at full about what my goals were politically, because it would have just produced backlash for no reason, for no gain with a bunch of people who are not primary concerns in my work. So I think, you know, people who have a grounded ethical framework and can choose their targets to use the Star Wars metaphor, the Death Star, more carefully. And they know they can play the long game instead of just seeing the immediate obstacle as the thing that's overproducing anxiety. So, you know, I think that being an academic is a long game. 
if it's the thing that you want as a long-term career. And so, you know, there are relationships that have to be tended and there are relationships that can be ignored and they can't be tended and ignored always at the same time. And so, you know, I think that the thing that gets you through those ups and downs, the things that gets you through the mobbing, the thing that gets you through the disappointment and the massive rejection and the failure is a grounded, you know, ethical center that is helping you to inform your praxis, whether it's research, teaching, service, or you know, labor outside of the academy. Um, I, I hear you, and um, as somebody who studies borders in a very different way, I, I can't help but hear it's like you're 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 talking about boundaries, and it sounds like um, both for folks who are seeking mentorship, but also for folks who who want to give mentorship, like recognizing that boundaries are essential to to keep in a healthy relationship um oftentimes i think folks will will sacrifice those boundaries personal boundaries even safety boundaries um in order to to have at the end of the day what is a really small slice of a of a not very big pie um and i i i add to that 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 having like a, a very specific understanding of boundary work isn't something that, that we're already inherent with, right? When you tell somebody like, you need better boundaries and they're like, well, I don't have any. So obviously I don't know how to have them, right? Telling people that they need to do boundary work is one thing, but then providing, and to me, this is an institutional thing. This is something that can come from like grad directors, can come from like new faculty orientations, but, but trainings on how to like recognize when somebody's crossing that like work-life boundary or that safety boundary is important. And then um, to counteract what Lisa said was like this, this language of power and domination that often gets utilized against people who are trying to build a coalition is, is having a language to counteract that and having a language of like personal safety. And this could be couched in like workers' rights or labor rights, which I think often times can be powerful, uh, especially when talking to institutions who have to abide by labor laws, saying that like, no, you're, you're infringing on my, my rights because I, I can only do so much labor and not recognizing the boundaries of that labor and where like me time and free time stop are, are like, are where we, we can train folks. Um, so maybe I don't know if anybody's part of, a, of an institution who does this kind of research or I'm sorry, does this kind of training for their researchers um, grad students or junior faculty, you know, that, that would be helpful to share. But, but I think that we should start thinking about those kind of trainings um, up front that talk about a trauma and talk about boundaries um, when, when coming into our institutions. I think too that for graduate students looking for community, the tendency is to like become really codependent and over invest in the roommate or the colleague like up front with like massive disclosure and then massive shame right because of the vulnerability and you know boundaries are also about pacing and slowing the thing down so that it doesn't just explode in this dysregulated mess of whatever so you know i really think that the that tendency to sort of trauma bond with um, with other graduate students that's a cycle that we absolutely have to break because it is really a really destructive thing and i think awareness of it helps but i agree with you completely like just say no you know if i could make fun of like nancy reagan for a minute is that actually saying no is a really useful skill set, <laughs> you know, um, when people are, when they're into the entire pyramid structure, the Ponzi scheme of the academy is about fracking ideas out of promising junior faculty and grad students. So, you know, learning how to say no, I think is like entry level skill set for being an academic. And then it also looks like, Michael, we have another question here. Um, what, if any, are the easiest policies or structures or systems to take on to dismantle oppressive individuals and networks? And what are the ones that have to wait to be um, managed by a dean or provost for them to take on? Do you have thoughts on that? I, I can just speak to something that we're trying to do now. Um, and our university is um, building a hiring plan um, and not to be too specific, but the hiring plan will require us to build a mentoring plan of how those folks who are coming into the department will be mentored through those aspects. And it's, it's, it's really all based on commitments and pledges to better ourselves as people who are doing mentoring work. And of course, 
build a, a relationship with somebody who can successfully navigate through the tenure track process, right? Uh, I think that this is, is so important simply because at the very least what you're doing is that the, across the board, every person who is part of that department is now invested in the language of mentorship. So it's not longer about like, ah, you're not being a good mentor. It's like, you're not following these procedures that we put out in, in the memo. And if you don't do A, B, and C, then we're not doing successful mentorship. I think giving people a tangible, measurable, uh, call it a rubric even, um, can, can, can really, I think, provide a framework for how we talk about mentoring. And then of course, uh, institutionalize this. I mean, um, to me, this would, this would just be about like, taking away the opportunity for toxicity. We're, we're making it transparent and upfront. We're giving institutions the role of, of being the network. So that way there is no, like, um, there's nothing that goes uh, unseen by those who are really taking responsibility for mentorship. Yeah, and I think deans are mostly middle management and can't do a whole lot to help to like culture issues in the department. Um, I think that they're useful allies in thinking through larger structures for like graduate stuff inside of a college. But, you know, the departmental stuff, I think they're just generally not going to intervene in. Um, I would say the same thing, almost the same, same thing about personnel issues, although in this new climate, I have been seeing deans roll out like improvement plans for asshole faculty who are like persistent multiple offenders for like trashy behavior of all the varieties we've discussed. And those improvement plans provide a rationality for modified work assignments that can include firing, although it's harder in the states that have unions. Um, so I think on the whole, you know, the policies and structures or systems, the easiest ones to change, honestly, are promotion and tenure. So I've been on those committees for a long time because I wanted to see how the sausage was made. And so those are places where you can have big bang for the buck, especially in like killing, you know, the use of, you know, racist, sexist student evaluations and substituting portfolios or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I also think that there are a lot of departments which kind of blows my mind in the same way like that the award structure blew my mind. It was very helpful and useful. Um, I think a lot of departments don't have guidelines or bylaws and those conversations among faculty and graduate students renorm a department around different things and actually can be very productive because I will tell you that the unspoken secret of calm and much of higher ed is just how top heavy it, it is. And so in my institution, it used to be an R2. And I would say two thirds of the faculty came in and taught a 3-3 and to get tenure, they had to write two articles that were nine pages a piece. So like we live in totally different worlds. Most of them don't conference, they don't publish, they're not active. You know, they don't, they have no sense about what the job market looks like now, but they knew what it was like 40 years ago. And so it, it, it the generational gap in higher ed especially in the publics is an unspoken secret that I think actually is producing a bunch of the structures that we find to be racist and sexist and homophobic and, you know, terrible. So, you know, an awareness of that generation, you know, issue in higher ed can help actually direct you towards which policies and systems are easiest to tackle and which ones, you know, can be immediately fixed through faculty governance and which ones have to be longer term projects of coalition building. Then. I also just to add to that, I think that we can leverage our professional associations too. Um, we are members of these organizations and they accumulate our resources to provide us with what would ideally be professional resources that can help us you know, reach our goals. If, if we can demand from our you know, professional organizations, RSAs, NCAs, ICAs and whatnot, that there's more attention given to building positive relationships, strong mentoring relationships, and trying to dismantle some of these myths about access or dismantle some of these myths about like patronage. Um, we might be able to try to use those resources to, to better our, um, our careers too. I think you were gonna say something. I was just paying attention here to the discord and about, um, uh, how can we utilize this space as a way to work towards collective coalition building and amplifying each other as a means to move a lot of the conversations into praxis? 
and bring it into our own communities is in the discord. So where do we go from here is a good place, I think, for us to meditate on. What do you think, Michael? Uh, yeah, really, this is the, we spent, you know, an hour and 45 minutes tearing down mentoring. So here's the 15 minutes of rebuilding, maybe. Uh, I would say, for one, um, just having a, a different approach to mentorship that is a, a, an approach of labor, something that you have to do that takes a lot of work. Um, but then, you know, once we've changed their self is, is to start, you know, asking our institutions to, to provide some of these um, resources. So um, I can share my email address, but as the, the task force um, chair uh, at NCA, I, I was uh, working with a great group of folks, inclu including Robert, to um, compile uh, research that could back our suggestions to NCA, right? This might be something that other professional organizations take on, but if anybody wants some of those resources or, or some of the summaries of, of that, that research, we can share them with you and then you can use them as justifications in your department why you need a, a constellation mentoring program and not just like pairing up people based on skin color and like their self-identified genders, right? That, that sort of, of evidence-based um, approach towards the people who, who make these decisions, especially hiring decisions and uh, graduate admissions decisions might be, might be a way to start. Yeah, we have that kind of mentoring program and I think it's been successful. I would also say that the model, the patronage model is about hoarding. So it's about hoarding resources and hoarding information and hoarding schema and hoarding ideas about how the power works and hoarding vocabulary and hoarding connection and hoarding access. And so anything that disseminates the stuff of the academy um, I mean, it's why the whole point of the conference is fugitivity. So stealing the information and sharing it and democratizing access to information, relationships, network, people, publications, whatever, that is the work moving forward, right? Both for mentors and mentees, regardless of where they are in their academic journey. So I think um, moving against hoarding as a model of uh, inside of that scarcity mindset and an opening up to understand that we actually do. And we all exist in networks that have the opportunity to build stuff, even if we can't all pull down the cash immediately to do it. Bunches of us can. So there are opportunities that we haven't imagined yet. And it's okay to imagine outside of what was already possible, right? Like, I mean, I think all of us who do the critical work have had to imagine careers for ourselves or jobs for ourselves or our time or our resources or our politics in ways that we could not have foreseen, but it's a matter of survival to be able to be able to produce new imaginaries. And I realized that that's sort of like, you know, in Michael's words, hippy dippy, but also, you know, the discipline has been totally closed for 125 years. Like, you know, I said to somebody the other day, I feel like this is like, you know, we're at the Brown versus Board of Education of calm in the last year like this is like the, the we are now a different kind of identity space like this is the first the first couple of years where really the thing has busted open to have these new conversations about what needs to actually be reimagined that conversation absolutely did not exist when i was going through graduate school it was totally static and stayed and closed it was a closed circuit there was no new information there were there was interdisciplinarity was just like you know a horrible threat on the horizon to the stability of like presidential studies or whatever. So I just feel like um, imaginary work is critical. And those are the spaces where the people want to do the building work and to do the part where theory meets history meets praxis like that is those are the people that want to do the work. And there are just people that are not going to and also we we can reimagine the field without them. And I think that's 100% what's happening now is that, you know, the reimagining is happening with or without them. Yeah, I mean, who needs them? I, I also think that maybe for every one of those kinds of folks in our field or our fields, there's somebody sitting around with like a bag full of money just wanting to be an ally and be patted on the back for being a great ally. And okay, great, give me the money. And I'll pat you on the back publicly for being a great ally, but give me the money first, right? I think that we can challenge our allies to to put the money where their mouth is. There's, there's so many people who do the lip service of inclusivity, of diversity, because it's great for their CV, it's great for their job trajectory. So then let's see what, they're, let's see what they, they can do with it. Um, you know, I, I think that's one way we can start this. I also think that we can exact a cost. 
I think it's useful to think about like if if you're going to say no, like I I have exacted costs from resignations or from rolling out of a situation that was toxic. And I think we can also really imagine ways of shutting down extra labor that produce resources for other things. So, you know, the thing, the resources are not finite, even though it's absolutely true that not all of the people in the field have equal access to those resources. No doubt. I mean, even even at the institution level, um, my institution does not have quite as many resources as other institutions. Um, but but this isn't to say that like that that can't change. Human beings make decisions about where the money goes, and those human beings can be persuaded with with I think very strategic plans, like maybe not the Death Star, but like very strategic plans about how you plan to to leverage that once it's done. I think that in in the number of times that I've asked big asks for institutional money to do something, it comes about half the time. And it, with, with a good justification and with a good plan with collaborators, you know, those things, those things can happen. Sorry, Robert, you were going to say something. Um, no, what I wanted to say, and I want to respond to Alex's um, comment in Discord, because I think it's the one that Lisa referenced and it's really important, which is how can we utilize this space as a way to work towards collective coalition building? And since I'm talking, I'll turn on my video. Um, I think one of the things that's uh, productive about this space, and, and I don't want to present this uh, virtual conference as perfect, uh, it's a work in progress, learning, we have amazing people are part of it, but I think one of the objectives of the organizers was to bring people who are doing good work across the disciplines, and I use the plural in that we have people who are coming from RSA, ICA, NCA, four C's and other spaces. And what I would encourage people who are finding these talks meaningful and empowering and inspiring is to go to the conference website look up the participants and panelists. We've got 42 amazing people who might be closer to you than you realize. They might be in your state, they might be in your institution, they might be in an organ, your professional association. Um, and if they're not, they by participating, they've shown an interest in investment and working with you. Um, look at the sponsors of who this conference are. They've sponsored this and, um, they, they might be interested in working with you on the things you're interested in. And then likewise, um, the Discord is, is a living, breathing document that has been created for this. And so, um, so you're going to see people who are engaging who you may not have known before. And I think those are um, some meaningful things that, that can, be, can be done. Um, and then the other thing I would say as for those who are interested, okay, so what do we do next is that this is a platform, this is a starting point, the work doesn't end here. Um, there, there's work that's being done by each of these individuals, whether it's the NCA task force on mentorship, RSA is doing a variety of white papers and uh, work in terms of thinking about mentoring, um, employment and other projects. And so um, these are definitely ongoing conversations. So I just wanted to say, say that really quick. Um, the other thing I want to say is that we are, um, this has been an incredible conversation. We only have seven minutes left. And so um, I just wanted to give this, this remaining time back to Michael and Lisa. And if there's anything each of you want to say that you feel is incredibly important that we should all know about power, patronage, or mentorship, um, please, the time is yours. I'll go first so that Michael can end with his brilliance. I would just say that people who are builders want to say yes. Okay, builders are not a no people. They say yes. If they can say yes, they say yes. And often they say yes, even when they shouldn't say yes, but they will say yes. So look for the people who are builders and squad with them because they know who else says yes. They know, I call them honeypots. They know where the honeypots of money are. They know where the people are who know the people. They know somebody else who's tried something similar and you can learn from their success and or failure. Like, you know, the people who are builders are often mavens and they have the networks or they're often, you know, willing to share all kinds of information. If you just ask, I mean, the cold call in some ways in the academy is like in sometimes the most fruitful thing you can do, just like the Twitter example, like 
Okay, sure, let's do a thing. And here's the Vita line, like that's fine. And so I think look for the people who are generous because they wanna say yes and they want more people to come in and they want to share what they know. They wanna democratize the information as quickly and as efficiently as possible so that people don't get treated poorly and so that the trauma doesn't continue. So understand that there are people who want to play that role in a way that is you know, generous and open and caring and ethical is what I would say. Yeah, absolutely. This isn't to say that we cancel the, the demolition crew. The demolition <laughs> crew can be very useful for various reasons. But I think that to recognize um, that builders and, you know, folks who, who do the demolition work can work hand in hand with each other and really have to work hand in hand with each other, right? There's no, like uh, Elutario said, there's no, you know, like, revolution when only the revolutionaries show up and there's no educators willing to, to build afterwards. Um, I'll also say this, that the, the field of communication, the, the rhetoric, um, other sort of tangential fields, I think have a really um, awesome potential to, to really take this idea of mentorship and, and theorize about it. Mentorship is ultimately about building networks of communication, about building relationships between people via like face-to-face -face or networked communications. I mean, these are, these are really things that are, are important to our field and, and why not? Um, so maybe again, back to where do we go from now? Well, let's start writing about it and theorizing about it in a way where our field can kind of take ownership over that and then produce the kinds of um, concepts around mentoring that, that we want instead of just reporting on the things that we, we haven't gotten. Um, and then also the last thing I'll say is, is, is to really lean into compassion. Um, especially given the, the state of the world and the state of our country and the state of many of our men, mentalities. And we, we have nothing to lose from being kind to each other. Um, if you can be safely kind to somebody, I, I encourage it. That's all I'd say. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I, I wish we could find a way to uh, give a round of applause to uh, Michael and, and Lisa. I'm going to turn off my video or on my video. Um, they've been incredibly wonderful, um, as was the uh, participants for the last seminar. I feel like this is um, going to be something we carry with us uh, for, for a while and just thinking again about how do we think about constellation mentorship? How do we think about working with dysregulated individuals who occupy our, our department? our institutions. Um, I love, uh, Lisa, what you said earlier about deadpanned responses as a way of diffusing that uh, uh, narcissistic dysreg uh, you know, dysregulation. But so much um, that was said that was very powerful. Um, what I want to do is I'm putting in the chat um, a link to next week's session so that way if you're um, if you found this uh, talk which I'm sure you did very engaging inspiring that next week um, on Friday we'll be having a session on uh, the labor of inclusion diversity access and equity I hope to see you there um, with that um, I think we're done for the day thank you all so very much Michael Elisa you've been wonderful Thank you, Robert, for, oh, thank for you, moderating. Robert. Thanks to the conference organizers for inviting us. Thanks to all the institutions for poning up the cash and the, the social capital to support this. It's been a great experience. Michael, it's great to see you. As always, it's lovely. Likewise, I'm glad we got to, to share this space today. And Robert, thanks again for a great introduction. Uh, and I want to say again, what Lisa said, the organizers for inviting me. Um, I really appreciate it. We're lucky to have you both, seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um. you.